Hello, physical science students. This is Mr. Kraft coming to you from my desk at Cal. I wish I was with you in person, but hopefully this uh, video will help you on the topic we're talking about. We are still in our textbook in chapter seven, and we're gonna talk about simple machines. But as a way to review some concepts before we get into that, I want to talk about some things that hopefully you already remember but we want to make sure just in case. So let's start by reminding ourselves of some things. Force. Force is a push or a pull, to put it in very simple terms. Or if you want to be more formal, that which can change an object's state of motion. So in other words, if an object is not moving and you make it move, a force did that. If an object is moving already and you stop it from moving, a force did that. If an object is moving uniformly, that means it's going at a constant speed in a constant direction, and you make it change direction, a force did that. I'm gonna remind you that the English unit of force is the pound, but this is science, so we're not gonna use it. An old BZ abbreviation for pound. The SI, or metric, which is what we're going to use, is the Newton. Now I'm writing in all caps there. If you write Newton properly, it would be lowercase. Capital N-E-W-T-O-N is some dead English guy. Lowercase N-E-W-T-O-N is a unit of force. But... When we abbreviate it, we always use a capital N, never a lowercase n. And a Newton is a kilogram meter. And technically, there should be a little dot in there to show multiplication, but that could be omitted, per second squared. Now, what that means is if you had a distance that was one meter long. And you've seen me demonstrate this in class. And you had an object, say a block, that had a mass of one kilogram. And you're putting a force on that that makes it move through that meter speeding up at an acceleration of one meter per second squared, that force is one Newton. Uh, don't worry about the details on that. Like I said, I've discussed this in class before. I've showed you this. I've actually slid books along the desk to show you this. So the unit of force is the Newton. Okay. So work, work, well, actually, let me not do it that way to begin with. Work is a force producing motion. A force. Okay, so work is a force producing motion. And as you've heard me say in class many, many times, if no motion occurs, no work occurs. If I lean against a wall and push as hard as I can, you know, unless I'm Samson and I knock the walls down, which is kind of a bad thing for me, um, no work occurs. The wall stays still, nothing happens. And so the formula for that is work equals force times distance. Well, force is measured in Newtons, 
distance in the metric system in the meter kilogram second version of it that we're using is measured in meters. So therefore work is measured in Newton meters, NM, Newton meters. But we have another name for a Newton meter, which is a Joule, J-O-U-L-E, abbreviated capital J. So the Joule is the metric unit of work, and it's also the metric unit of energy, because after all, work is just energy in action. Now, we also have potential energy, which you remember we talked about. We're not going to be too worried about potential energy today because uh, we're talking about simple machines. We're getting there. And if you've got a machine, you're actually doing something. The work is energy in action, so we're not too worried about potentials. Then one more thing, power is work per time. So power means how fast am I doing the work? So if I walk just shuffling very slowly, I walk 10 feet. Compare that to running as fast as I can for 10 feet. The energy is the same. The amount of energy it takes to move the mass of my body a certain distance, like here, some great artwork here. Maybe I'll walk a certain distance. It takes me five seconds. Then maybe some more great art. Maybe I cover a certain distance in five seconds and I cover a certain distance in one second. I'm going to call the amount of work I do here work one and the amount of work I hear work two. Well, you know what? Work one and work two are going to be exactly equal because the amount of energy or work it takes to move my body, that distance is not going to be different. But the power, the power the second time is greater than the power the first time because I'm using that energy up much, much faster the second time. So, let me see. Wrong tool, that's okay. So let me erase that. So the formula for power, work per time, and in mathematics, when you see the word per, P-E-R, that tells you there's gonna be some division happening. So, work equals power over change in time, where capital Greek letter delta means change in. Some textbooks just show T because if the, t the understanding is that the time must be changing. If the time was not changing, then there'd be no power, there'd be no work, no nothing. So power, I, gee whiz, I totally got that reversed. I apologize. Let me reverse that, okay. Power equals work per time, okay. I don't have the software to edit the error out. Um, and it would take too much money to get it. So that's okay. You know, if I make a mistake on the chalkboard or the dry erase board in class, I just say, okay, I was wrong. I made a mistake and I fix it. So that's what I'm going to do here. Power P equals work W over time or change in time. Well, work is measured in joules. Joules. Time is measured in seconds. So a joule per second is what we call a watt. 
you're spelling it, it's lowercase, but the abbreviation's always capital. So you say power and somebody says, what? Okay, that was a stupid joke for the day. All right. So now what we want to look at is simple machines. Your book may define it differently, but you could say a simple machine is a device that allows allows one to do work more efficiently. So, for an example, if I have a piano, and I'm trying to lift it, see so here comes sweat probably not going to go very well, but if I have a set of pulleys which are put together in kind of a way that we call a block and tackle, then I very well might be able to lift the piano. So the pulleys, the block and tackle, I'm not going to define that right now. We're not worried about that at the moment. A block and tackle is a particular setup of pulleys. Of course, a pulley is like a little wheel that has kind of a groove in the middle that you can thread a rope or a cord through and the pulley can be attached or it can be free hanging and your rope comes out the other end and you pull things through it, hence the word pulley, duh. You know, the uh, strength I have here is not different from the strength I have there. Uh, the simple machine does not turn me into Superman, but what it does, it allows me to use the energy more efficiently. And that's the beauty of simple machines. So, simple machines give a person mechanical advantage and this is in your book on page 133 and the mechanical advantage is pretty much what it says it is. It's mechanical, which means something is moving. Because if nothing's moving, then nothing interesting is happening. And you know what an advantage is. You know, it means you're better able to do something. So it makes you able to do more than you normally would be able to do, makes it more efficient. And I guess I should describe what I mean by efficient. Now you've probably heard the word efficient before. And you probably 
would like it if I spelled it correctly too, that would be a good idea. You probably kind of sort of know what efficient is without being able to find it. Doing work by using less energy. Doing work by using less energy. Now we have to be careful what we mean by that. We know from the first law of thermodynamics, which I've told you before, that you never can get out the full amount of energy. There's a limit to what you can get. It's neither created nor destroyed. And the second law says you always lose some. So uh, usually, well, I shouldn't say usually. It's not usually. I'm going to abbreviate thermodynamics thermo. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics, if you recall, says that the amount of energy that can be usefully put to work, the amount of energy available for use is always going down over time. So a non-technical way to say that would be to say all actions involve some wasted energy. The example I gave you in class was a car. If you have been driving around a car for a while and park it, you put your hand on the hood, it's hot. That heat is going right out into the air. It's not moving the car forward. That heat is wasted. Even something as simple as me marking on this whiteboard, something as simple as that does waste some energy. My hands, my fingers, my arm are not perfectly efficient. You always waste energy. You can't not. You always will waste energy no matter what you do. And that is simply because of the second law of thermodynamics. You cannot get around that. Even though you can't get around that, though, what you can do is waste as little as possible. So what you could redefine efficiency as... So efficiency means you waste as little energy as possible. So maybe, I'm going to just draw a diagram. So maybe this is me doing something. And the blackened in area is waste. I do this little tiny amount of work and I waste all of that energy. So maybe what I want to do is waste less energy. So I'm doing the same thing, but here more of the energy I'm using goes into useful work, the white area, than gets wasted, whereas here almost all of it's wasted. Now, of course, something like this where there's no waste, well, sorry, but that's not possible. Second law forbids that. But the second law doesn't say that we can't reduce the waste. So you might say a 
a simple machine helps us waste less energy. It can never allow us to waste no energy. That's not possible. If that were possible, you'd be violating your laws of thermo. You'd be having perpetual motion machines. Who knows what you end up with? But it can help us to waste less energy. So this is still on page 133 in your book. It gives an example. It says, suppose you wanted to move something 3,300 3, newtons. And of course, a newton equals a force. But a force is also the same thing as weight because weight is just the force of gravity holding something in place. So you have something. They're going to say you're lifting a 3,300 newton grand piano, 740 pounds, two meters vertically. So here's the piano. There's the keys. You want to raise it vertically. Well, just by your simple definition of what your work is, work equals FD, force times distance, 3,300 newtons times 2 meters is 6,600 joules of work. And that's going to be quite a bit. And you notice your book, you could call that effort. Same basic idea. Then they say you use a block and tackle system of six pulleys. I'm not going to try to draw that with accuracy. Because we're not doing an art class here. But a block and tackle setup, you have the pulleys together and the, that's not six, obviously. I don't know what it looks like exactly. But you have the rope threaded through the pulleys. They go in a certain pattern. Then they're hooked to something that's strapped around the piano. So there should be six pulleys here. I'm not going to try to draw that. And then the rope goes over here to somebody who's pulling it. He pulls this way and the piano goes up. So they're saying, when you do that and they measure it, they discover that you use only 550 newtons. So if you are trying to lift the piano directly, If you were trying to lift the piano directly, you'd have to exert 6,600 joules on it. But they use a six pulley block and tackle and they measure the force and it turns out that it's only 550 newtons, which is a whole lot less. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, 550 newtons. So that's the force much, much less than what you would have had otherwise. So MA, which stands for mechanical advantage, equals the weight of what you're trying to lift over the effort, which is what you actually put in. The weight of the piano was 3,300 newtons, but with the block and tackle over here, you put in only 550 newtons of effort in force, and they get six. MA mechanical advantage is six. So that means lift, lifting the piano 
using a block and tackle is six times easier, six times more efficient than trying to lift it directly. And you probably couldn't lift it directly at all. So that's an example of what mechanical advantage is. Now your book does distinguish two different kinds. I'm going to abbreviate mechanical advantage. The ideal mechanical advantage is kind of what we are calculating here. Uh, you're saying perfectly what would it do if no energy was lost at all. If the amount of energy you put in here and the amount of energy shown by the piano moving were exactly identical, they're not ever going to be because there's going to be a certain amount of energy in the form of heat lost. If you were to use a thermometer and measure the temperature of the pulleys before you lifted the piano and after, they would be slightly hotter afterwards because some of that friction of the rope going through the pulleys turns into heat, goes shoom, out into space, and is wasted. Um, in fact, that's not necessarily bad. If you didn't have the friction at all, it would slide through the pulleys and you couldn't lift it at all. But the friction does make some wasted energy, thermodynamics again. The actual mechanical advantage, the, uh, the AMA is always going to be less than the IMA because of thermo which is a very, very short way of saying because of the laws of thermodynamics. But what we'll be doing in this chapter, we'll be looking at ideal because it makes the calculations easier just to get the point across. Okay, that is an overview of what we're talking about with machines. So we're always looking at forces. We're always looking at work and we're trying to find the greatest efficiency we can by getting the best mechanical advantage we can. So what I would like you to do is read. If you haven't already, I think I may have asked you to read some of this before, but it's been over a week since I've seen you face to face. So it would not hurt. If you have read this already, Read it again. It won't hurt you. If not, then read it. You need to know it. From pages 129 to 134. And do section review. I don't think we have done this yet. If we have, then ignore me. Section review, one through 10, page 134. And we will be talking about specific simple machines next time. See you then. Bye.